in 2004, and it was a collaboration between WSU Extension and the school district with support from uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Southwest Washington, Clark County Solid Waste, uh, the National Garden Association, uh, the Hazeldale Community Neighborhood Association, and some other community partners. The plans were made for the garden in conjunction with uh, Vancouver Public Schools grounds crew and the assistance of a major grant from Clark County um, Solid Waste the support of, of WSU Extension uh, plus the Vancouver uh, Foundation for Public Schools. So we did some planning and figured out uh, that this space, which had previously been a, a workshop area for the grounds crew, that the soil was not contaminated and it was good to go. And it was a great area for the garden because it's a large space that was kind of out of the way and it, but yet accessible to the school. Well, uh, in this school is grades kindergarten through fifth grade, and we encourage uh, the teachers and the students to use the garden. Uh, the major problem has been, shortly after the garden was founded, uh, No Child Left Behind became a major factor in education, and the teachers had only a certain amount of time, a certain amount of time for math, a certain amount of time for reading, a certain amount of time for science, and the garden it's very hard to incorporate the garden into those time restraints. Uh, but over the years, we've had many programs that we as garden volunteers and master gardeners have offered to the school, and also a summer program for the Boys and Girls Club, where we have one morning a week during their summer session, have the students out to the garden for two hours for a work and a lesson and a healthy snack. Uh, and during the school year, we have the enrichment fair once a year at the school. We have a program that we offer with a broad range of students that sign up for, to come to the garden and we've done a lettuce eat program where the students get to sample different varieties of lettuces and choose their favorite and make healthy snacks from lettuces such as lettuce rolls with a cheese stick and lettuce dips with uh, salsa and ranch dressing and that's always a real fun event. And we've also had students out for the traditional Mother's Day marigold planting and also to help us plant the bean seeds in late school. Well, we have about almost 35 raised beds, and we have some larger beds that are made with concrete blocks, which you'll see later in the tour. And those beds, initially we were using as communal beds to share the harvest with people who, who came to help and who had maybe had vegetable gardens of their own here for a while we were renting beds to help with the garden maintenance because the more people we had into the garden the more people there were to maintain the garden but now we have shif shifted our focus and we're using all the beds for um, food production for the food bank and for share and then the school children can have um, the teachers can have beds if they wish and the boys and girls club can do activities if they wish or they can just observe the vegetables that we are growing to help the food insecure in our community. And also for the school backpack program in the uh, fall particularly, but also some vegetables that are ready in the springtime. We are fortunate to have an irrigation system and um, I have become uh, the irrigation maintenance person, which is a real stretch because I knew nothing about this before I started volunteering, but now I am feeling uh, pretty confident of being able to fix the uh, uh, soaker hoses and to uh, set the timer on the irrigation system. And
are blessed or cursed with the freeway wall. So we do have a lot of noise and it sometimes does make um, teaching in the garden difficult. But we did want to soften the freeway wall to make it uh, less gray. Uh, so we've planted kiwis here and we have the hardy kiwis and the traditional fuzzy kiwis. Uh, and we were looking for a crop that would be able to be harvested when school is in session and uh, that would also be a vine that would cover the freeway wall. So the kiwis helped. They do require massive pruning, um, most of them in January or February, and the male kiwi uh, in the summer after it's bloomed and the pollination has taken place. So you have to be prepared for annual major pruning and major debris to have to get rid of. Okay, hi. This is the Hazeldell School and Community Garden Butterfly Garden. It was uh, designed by uh, fifth grade classes uh, shortly after the garden was founded. And since then, we've tried to plant more perennials so that we have things year round since it's right off the playground when we had herbaceous perennials. The, um, and, they, and they died back. The kids were running over everything and trampling things down. So we've tried to have um, the perennials, the evergreen perennials, to come back each year to still attract butterflies and hummingbirds and bees. And as you can see, there's some bees that work right here on some of the flowers. Okay, you also, if you ask about vandalism, if we have trouble with vandalism, we have had some off and on uh, issues, but we've taken some steps to help. And also the location of the garden, because it's way off across the playground, kind of in a corner. So it's not real obvious to someone who's looking to, to get into trouble. Uh, it is kind of hidden. And we do have a, a, a gate, and we have a double lock system on this. So we have a school district lock, so that the, uh, anybody from the school district they can get in when they need to. And then we have our community lock, which is now a combination lock. And we have that uh, here, so either lock will unlock the garden, which adds uh, that security to have school district and our community volunteers. And then we also put up a couple of these um, signs about being under uh, surveillance, and I think that has helped deter people. Okay, um, these are our blueberry bushes. We have several blueberry bushes here, which are really great. They are not uh, hard to take care of. We fertilize once a year, and we prune once a year. Uh, they're pretty easy for the amount of nice crop that we get out of them. Previously we've had raspberries in the garden and those got out of control more and required uh, more severe pruning and uh, knowledge about when to prune and what to prune. So we've decided that blueberries are an easier crop and um, they're very popular with everyone who comes. We a cloth that you use on the floor of a greenhouse, but it's water permeable. So we have cut these to fit our beds and secured the edges with tape so they don't unravel. And in the fall, when we put the garden to bed, we put these on each bed and we hold it down with pavers. We've got a bunch of pavers, um, hold it down with a paper on each, each side, each corner. And that helps over the winter so that we don't get the, the weed growth and it also then, the water doesn't pool, it goes through. So this has been successful for our location. We actually have a bed that had a hoop house on it, and we have done some of that. But we have found in, in the winter it is harder to you know, come out and care for um, the crops. However, if a, if a teacher, like for instance this fifth grade group that's going to talk about a life-sustaining garden, that would be an ideal situation for them to overwinter crops because they would be here where they could care for them and um, make sure that the they're getting the kind of care that they would need over the winter and uh, taking the, the hoop house off if it was a very sunny day and making sure they were watered and things like that. So I think that would be something I would recommend. Well, I think that that would depend upon what the teachers or the students want to plant. Maybe it would be good for them to do a little uh, research into some things that um, they might want to plant so that the impetus for what to plant is coming from those who are going to plant it. And then of course there are pretty basic things like radishes that are quick to grow that will be rewarding because the kids will be able to harvest those relatively soon. And then it's always good to do some research into the types of crops that if the kids
plants aren't going to be there in the summer, that you can plant in the spring and it would be harvested in the fall and then have those, like those fourth graders who are going to be in fifth grade next year, have the, those two teachers collaborate so that the kids who planted that crop, like the um, carrots or the beets or something, they can go over and be harvested then when school starts. Um, and then I think lettuce is always good because um, the kids can discover that there's different kinds of lettuces and not just head lettuce and spinach and just, oh, you know, in the spring you want to do all those cool weather green crops and um, then as the, before school's out, do the crops that could um, summer over. And then another really popular uh, crop is potatoes because the kids loving potatoes, love digging potatoes. It's like a, a treasure hunt when they dig the potatoes. Look, I found a potato! <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of fun for them to do that. I think uh, the picnic tables are a really good asset. We do have potting tables. Um, we have the kids out to use, but a picnic table could serve that purpose just as well. And um, kids can spread out over a picnic table, and the instructor can be where all the kids can just turn sideways and see. Uh, I think that that's the most universal, easiest thing to have picnic tables. And then it's nice to have some kind of a cover on the picnic tables because uh, you know the dirt, the soil will go through the cracks. And, Pretty cool. <laughs> in the dirt underneath their feet. Well, it's probably good to do a unit either the when you get out to the garden or in the classroom before coming out about um, beneficial insects and how most um, insects are beneficial and have the kids understand that spiders are really helpful in the garden. You want to leave spiders alone so they can do their thing and the bees are busy pollinating and just so that the kids then don't feel threatened by maybe some insects and bugs that they aren't familiar with or that they in the past have just run away from or see people just you know try to swat in a, a bee which is never a good idea that, so that they know that 98% um, of, of bugs are beneficial and uh, maybe even have a, a slug hunt so they know that these slugs are pests and, and that that's something they might want to get rid of but that basically everything else is is probably a good thing in the garden. Start, but start small. A, a dream big and start small. Those are all really important things to consider. It's uh, easier to ramp up than to ramp down. So you want to have a, a manageable space, maybe just a four by eight bed, and see how it goes. And make sure that you have the support of the, the principal and the teachers and everybody on board and is excited about having an outdoor learning space. Uh, use the many tools that are available either through Master Gardeners or Clark County uh, and online uh, across the nation. There's a lot of um, resources available. And I, in fact, have a whole list of resources, online resources. Um, so you can usually find something that you can adapt to what you want to do rather than having to start all over. Plus you'll get a lot of ideas from what other people are doing which will spark um, your, own, your own ideas and then you can add to that uh, internet pool of resources. Used by the teachers and the students at the school and the idea was initially that each teacher or each grade would have a bed that they would design and plant and, and learn from and do projects everything from figuring out um, square footage and you know how much soil or bark you would need to put down in a certain area and have um, writing starts and just using the garden as an inspiration. Yeah. Well that's good. I, I you know I, I do think that you want to start you want to start small but a really important thing would be to make sure that you have um, the, the teachers and the principal on board and that the garden is part of their thought process and that they realize that the garden is their garden and it's an outdoor learning area. It's not just the garden someplace off in Tuleyville, but it is their opportunity to have outdoor learning and to have everybody buy into the garden and to share those benefits, that, that how beneficial it is for kids to be outdoors, uh, that it's a, a peaceful, can calm down students and that those kids that are 
discipline problems in the classroom can really relate to the garden, and just all the benefits of nature and being outdoors, and, you know, centering and increasing long-term learning, uh, have everybody be aware of those things and, and eager to come out to the garden. who um, really, you could just tell, from his behavior, you could tell that he was a behavior issue in the classroom. And he was so excited to be out here. Once he calmed down, he was so engaged, and he asked about coming back, and if he could volunteer in the garden. Now mind you, this is a fifth grader, and he was just so excited. So we sent home some extra information with him uh, to kind of help um, maintain that engagement in the garden. And on the whole, we have found out the kids that are behavioral issues in the classroom oftentimes just really find their niche in the garden. They can be outside, they can move around. Uh, it's an interesting, engaging activity. And when you see those kids just really become engaged and passionate about something, it really makes it all worthwhile. So Barbara, go ahead and is there anything else you'd like to add uh, to what the video uh, talked about? Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone who's attending the webinar for your time and your interest. And I hope that this is worthwhile for you and that we can answer some questions and help you on your way to some rewarding uh, garden experiences with your students. Um, uh, then uh, the other thing was we talked about what we cover the beds with, with in the winter. And I want to give a little background on that. We have tried many different things. And for us, the uh, greenhouse flooring material is what has worked best. We tried uh, cover crops and leaves and burlap and sheets. And uh, this is our most recent effort and it has uh, been successful for the last couple of years. So we've been, for our location, we've been happy with that. Anyway, so if there's any questions, we'll be glad to give it a shot. I think, does Jody or Bobby want to add anything? Anyway, I want to add that um, we partnered back in early, like it was 2004, 2006 when we first started. And I came on and it, Barbara has done such a great job and Barbara and Bobby has been just a really great addition. And um, one of the things that I really want to highlight is that we did a summer program with the Boys and Girls Club and we were able to touch on like some simple things like just garden treasures and teaching kids about the, um, the, you know, the, the six um, parts of the plant and the kids got to explore and eat and they did a scavenger hunt and it's just like really just giving them the time to just be outside and explore. And so I think that was one of, I think our favorite things about the garden. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a lot of work um, and starting small is a really great idea. And that summer garden program with the Boys and Girls Club, we have done that uh, since the summer of 2005 uh, up until last summer and then of course this summer we couldn't and we're going to resume it again next summer but that's been a, um, a, a very rewarding effort to work with the kids and to, to see them out in the garden and we let them do real tasks like spreading bark and weeding and things that really make a difference in the garden. I share my screen okay so just once again to give context as to where we are we're in Hazeldell and there's Hazeldell Avenue just south of, let's scroll up here, 78th Street. So 78th Street, come down the way and there's the school. Tucked away back here in the, in the background is the garden. So this is the space we're talking about. Here's the butterfly garden. Oh, and you, this is a good view that shows how many beds we have. You can see um, we have like uh, 10 smaller beds in the front and then some much larger beds. And then in the back we have, um, about 18 beds in, in, in the back that are more closely spaced. Yeah, and I think um, Hazeldell is one of the few elementary schools in the Vancouver School District, let alone I think Clark County, to have a greenhouse and a full-size greenhouse. Lakeshore has a small greenhouse that's attached to the building, so I think it's a really unique setting to have a greenhouse. Um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about how you use your greenhouse and how that helps you or um, 
Yeah, sure. And how, long, how long have you had it? I mean, you started without the greenhouse, right? No, well, the greenhouse was um, pretty early on. Uh, we got a grant from the uh, school district foundation at, at the point when they were giving um, school enrichment grants of that size. And um, w we now have a raised bed in the greenhouse, which we do some early spring planting which is really good because then when the kids come out for the enrichment fair and some other things, we have crops growing when the rest of the garden is, you know, still pretty winter, you know, with nothing in it. And we have um, potting tables and we have the two picnic tables in there so we can have kids uh, out when the weather's inclement and still um, do learning in the garden. Um, and we, you know, of course we store wheelbarrows and, um, the greenhouse is also this like really fascinating place that kids want to go in and see, you know, um, not all the kids that we work with um, have an opportunity to ever really go into a greenhouse. And so they're, they're curious, like what's inside. And so um, uh, it's arranged so that it's really user friendly. And, um, you know, we store stuff in there, but we also like have the raised bed of course, and then we have some potting, um, potting tables, and then there's, there's um, also some picnic tables in there. So we can do activities if it's raining. So if there was after school programming with Boys and Girls Club that Snap Ed was doing with um, food and nutrition education, we were able to go over there and use that space. Yeah. And so many books that are so great, so. And thank you for listening to that. I know that some schools I work with, um, the librarian at the school is really excited to showcase some uh, library books, based, especially based on the seasons and things that can be replicated then in the garden. So kids can read with their library program or their, their reading program at school and then yeah. see it real life out in the garden. Um, you also have a tool shed on site. Uh, how long have you had the tool shed? Has that been around since the, the beginning as well? We, we really started with, we didn't have all the beds at, at the beginning. We've added beds, but we started with the tool shed and the greenhouse because we knew we needed to have those to make the garden work mm -hmm. and we got a grant from the National Garden Association and we're able to get start off with quite a few uh, tools and over the years we've added to those tools uh, with uh, some grants from the uh, Master Gardener uh, Foundation. Awesome so I, I'm gonna guess with as many teachers we have on the call um, the first the two questions I usually hear is who maintains the gardens <laughs> how often do you have to maintain and then what do you teach so maybe you can cover those two questions who are some of the partners over the years that, who've been able to help you with maintaining the gardens? And then what are some of the, the key things that you love to teach in the garden that the kids just love to soak up? Well, um, for um, maintenance, um, um, Bobby, my co-partner, has um, recruited everyone in her yoga class and most of the people she goes to church with. And, um, you know, I've recruited a few people too, uh, some other master gardeners and uh, Together right now, we have a very strong group of people that come every Tuesday for a couple of hours, and that has really helped. We also have a um, partnership with one of the classes at Clark College, and uh, they will come out um, once in the spring and once in the fall, and you know, like 30 college students, and we have a list of tasks that we get through in the hour and a half that they're there. Um, but Pretty much it's, it's all a volunteer basis. And our goal would be to have the school more involved, to have the PTA involved and uh, to have more classroom teachers involved and more students involved that would be utilizing the garden for educational things and doing some weeding while they're out there. And that's what we had it as a community garden for several years when the teachers weren't utilizing the garden as, as much as we'd hoped then we opened it up to the community for community beds because then we asked people not only to take care of their bed but to take care of the paths just around their bed. So the more people you have engaged in the garden, uh, the more that maintenance is spread out over a larger community and Bobby and I don't end up doing it all. Right, and just real quick before we get to the ed education component, Barbara, have you had any high school students uh, volunteer or any partnerships, mentorships? Yeah, or yes, we have. Well, well, VSAA comes out for their day of caring every year, and that's junior high and high school. And then we've had some um, students who've needed to have their uh, community service hours who've come out and helped out. So, and then we've had uh, Eagle Scouts do several projects for us, the kiosk and uh, some of the irrigation work yeah. and some of the other things for Eagle Scout projects. 
we were very pleased with their uh, those results. Awesome, great, thank you, Jody. Um, yeah, so when it comes to ed garden education, there is like so many things that you can um, make applicable that to work. Um, in the summertime during our uh, our the time that we had with the Boys and Girls Club, we would we would set ahead like what our um, our goals were, and some of them would be like we're going to talk about pollinators and why pollinators are, pollinators are important, and then they would have a book related to pollinators, and the Master Gardener. Um, program has put the education committee has put together these really great activities and then you'd have a journaling session and so um, if I could share the document of like a little recap of what um, what a typical day would look like in the garden if you wanted to do a certain lesson we, you can also do things um, like nutrition and talk about food health and you can talk about a little bit about food safety and why that you it's important to eat local because eating local your food is fresh it's picked at the right time that it's supposed to be picked um and you can um you can talk to them about like what are some what are what, what are things that grow local in our state um and then you another fun thing to do is bring those vegetables to the, if, if you're not already growing them, like bring in an avocado and bring in a, a banana and look at them and then have them compare them and find out like this banana was once in uh, South America and it wasn't too long. Like even this banana has traveled a lot more than some of us that are here. Um, it's also fun to teach them how to select a fruit and vegetable once it's ripe. Um, once it's ready to go and and then open it and taste it. It's really great having the berries there because the kids can pick those right off the vines. Um, they like lettuce and kale. Um, other things that we've done is uh, math. You can, I mean, it's just, it's endless um, on just the activities you can do. Um, but I always like just go back to like our best times was when the kids, one, got a chance to explore the garden on their own or with a buddy um, when they got the opportunity to just sit and listen and look around in the garden. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up the screen share and show you one of our garden journals for the summer. And there's some also really great pictures. Thank you. And All right. I'd like to add too that when the children come out to the garden, uh, Jody and I usually review the garden rules every time the kids come out. It just takes a few minutes to do and it kind of sets the tone that you know we're in a we're in a garden space and it's you're still in a learning environment and we need to be careful of the tools so usually the school rules are like to respect others respect yourself and um, respect the property respect the property and, and over how those relate to the garden yeah and then we'll bring like a tool out and we'll show like what how how you would and wouldn't use the tool and you know it's some most of that's pretty obvious but it's okay to go it's okay to go over that stuff every time because then they, there's an expectation and then um we go through like what is you know what are the this is just the background a little bit about uh, the background of the garden but it's being given a task and it's just kind of not meaning anything so we explained to the kids the um, concept of like the service of value and how you're giving back to your community and how the foods that's grown in the garden is going to the local food bank or the local pantry or the or share house or it's going to the um, the women's shelter down the street. You know, it's just it's just a lot of fun. Um, so here's some fun another or some fun activities we did um, worms. The Diary of a Worm is really great. Um, this is just like a really popular book. I think, you know, pretty much everybody has it in their library. And then this other one on vegetables where you can take the, some of the vegetables that we eat after our snack and then we can compost it. Bobby was always really good about doing the, the worm lesson. Um, and she ended it with a, a gummy worm sometimes. So that was kind of fun for the kids to have um coming from a nutrition standpoint i was like ah, i think I'm, I'm just gonna let that one slide but um the kids could um pick up a worm they could also identify some of the other insects um and we work closely with the master composter and recycling program um p dubois is just he's a really great um partner if you want to uh, create a compost in your in your school's garden or um if you want to create a compost in your classroom so this is just what, this is a good example of what the garden would look like um, in the summertime when, 
um, would go. I think that it's always important to have a place that is shady um, because it just gets really hot. And the other thing um, that's so important is water. So even when the kids aren't thirsty, it's important for them to drink water because they thirsty, tired and thirsty kids make bad decisions. And so <laughs> they, get, they get tired really fast and it's just nice to keep them nice. So this is a pollinator, pollinator. And then harvesting is always fun when the kids learn how to harvest it. And then we also teach them to like, if you saw this in the grocery store, would you want to buy this in the grocery store? Like, is that tomato, is that tomato ready? Is that cucumber the right size? Is it, you know, is that squash maybe too big? Um, and then use that, use, use it practically. And then also have them try weigh some of the, ve the, the vegetables and then estimate the cost. We also did a really great lesson on water and water quality. And so the kids got to crush up these papers and like make a mountain and they used um, watercolor markers. So when they sprayed and we'd, we'd make it, we'd be like, make it rain. And so um, we'd spray and they could see where the water runoff was going. Um, and I would like to say while we're going back that the uh, Master Gardeners Garden Discovery Team has put together some educational kits and um, we can get you a list of what kits are available for checkout, but they have a lot of resources in the kit. It's like in a big, big box and um, it, it might have, um, it might have a lesson plan or it might have just some items in it to help you to facilitate some learning in the garden and have some materials already gathered together to just help uh, with whatever topic you're trying to teach. Awesome. So we have a few minutes for questions. I've unmuted everybody. Go ahead, you then have to unmute for you, from your end. If you have a question, this is like a wealth of experience here. We also have Chris Potter in, uh, with Battleground River Homelink School and Erica Johnson with WSU Master Gardener. So you, you have a wealth of information here. So go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Barbara. It's yeah. Chris. Hi, it's Chris. nice to see you. Um, are the Clark County homegrown beds still there or did you replace those? Oh no, those are still there. We just, um, uh, one of the Eagle Scout projects was they added up because we'd been putting oh, okay. the bark down. All of a sudden we didn't, they were even with the ground. Right, right, right. right. So okay. We used that as the um, framework for adding a, 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 a little bit higher bed. Nice. Yeah. I think those might be the only ones left in the county. <laughs> oh my God. And then we also had irrigation. Another thing with the irrigation we did is we put a turnoff valve on each bed so that when a bed's not planted yet or when we've already harvested from that, we can turn the water off to each bed individually. And we can also then adjust the water somewhat by how much water we're letting in. The garden is on a little bit of a downhill slope. So of course the water from the upper goes all the way down to the bottom. So the bottom beds need less water than the top beds do because they pick up the Remember that one forum, like way, way back when you and I were the only school gardens in the county? Oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. That. Luckily, but, times have changed. So we um, thank goodness. I, I would like to talk a little bit more about water just in general. Um, the snap -It program has done a fourth grade, a garden, like a garden and enhanced nutrition class where we'd come in and we do some of the stuff, um, some of the classes in the garden and some of the classes in the classroom. And water is huge. So when you're thinking if you want to put in a garden, um, how the water is going to, how, how, what's the plan to water? Um, Mill Plain Elementary has a really great setup. Um, uh, and they have water bins and they have to bring the water from the school. And so they have like, like this 300 like long ho foot long hose, but they fill up a series of barrels. Um, and those barrels then can also feed the, um, their, there's a uh, irrigation to the beds. So putting rack kind of trying to wrap your head around like, how are we gonna irrigate this? And how close is the water? And, you know, a lot of times you need a water key when you're outside. Um, to, to do the irrigation. So that's definitely something to keep. Um, I, I know with recess, we, we were gonna do some recess things and we were gonna have like the uh, aides in the uh, cafeteria, like uh, give out coupons to kids that, so we'd have a limited number of kids. We'd have the amount of kids that we could handle in the garden for the amount of volunteers we had. And that could be determined each, each time we had volunteers. So some days there might be eight kids and some days there might be 16 kids allowed out. But to set up a, a way that 
uh, how you're going to select who gets to go, if it's going to be everyone from one classroom or if it's going to be a reward for good behavior or whatever. And then in the garden for recess, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do, everything from just showing the kids how to weed. And when I weed with kids, even if they're college students, I show them how to weed. I review how to weed because lots of times they don't know how to get the roots out or how to kind of tease the weed out so that you get observations to um, just exploring the garden to actually doing tasks like weeding or spreading bark. It depends on how much time they have and what, what how you want to structure it. Yeah. And we had uh, last week's webinar was Chris Potter from River Home League Battleground and Mark Watchman from Battleground. Um, and we'll have that video available. So if you weren't able to join us last week, we'll have that video of Chris and Mark's presentation. And then maybe even encourage them to do another session as we get closer to spring um, to really make sure we're, because hopefully by spring, we'll all be back on campus and ready to Hopefully. literally dig in the dirt. Love this idea of um, having stuff at recess. You know, um, the kids that want to go to recess could sign up early, you know, and make sure you have a bucket with gloves and and all of your tools ready to go. Um, the kids love wearing gloves, but they also love losing them. And they um, and then going over like some tool safety and um, there is a lot of really good resources out there so you could bring out a chart that that um it's like a laminated tool safety chart and then you could keep it in the bucket so then they would they would know and then also teaching them just like some basic tools like what is a shovel what is a you know what's a trowel what is a you know and and then also some basic just garden vocabulary um oftentimes i'll have kids say i don't know what harvest means or they don't know what the word agriculture means or they don't know um you know, they they won't they won't know like, I mean, a harvest one. The harvest is like, what does that mean, really, exactly? And so it's just good to kind of go over those basic um, vocabulary words, and I can provide those um, to you if you ever. I mean, I have like I have stuff from classes that I've done that I could give to people. Checklist or step by step process to get started with our school. Yes, there is, and actually, the next webinar, um, I think it's next week, is uh, greening of schoolyards. How to get started. So hopefully you can join us for that. Once again, that will be recorded as well. I'm gonna cover that one. Um, and depending on which district you're in, I'm very familiar with Vancouver and Evergreen schools and their processes to get started, but I'm also familiar with Battleground and we have a couple of our experts are from Battleground. So we're familiar with kind of the administration and what their rules are to get started in the gardens because everybody's a little bit different, um, but everybody wants safety um, and security first and foremost and make sure it's sustainable. So like Barbara said in the video, start small so that it can be maintained over time and hopefully be integrated into the culture of the school. Um, and then so the resource is the WSU Master Gardener site has a whole section on uh, starting school gardens. And I don't know, Erica, if you're online, if you could type that link in to um, the school garden. Yeah, it's, it's not a simple link. Um, if one goes to WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardeners and it looks for school gardens, it can be found there. Okay, thank you, Erica. Yeah, and it's in the video as well. So, uh, I can send you that link. Um, but there's also um, Clark County Green Schools, uh, Michelle Sano um, and Kaylee uh, Burton McCoughlin uh, manage that program. So they, between Master Gardener's School Garden website, if you just Google it, it'll pop up. And then the Clark County Green Schools also has a resource page for school gardens. So those are two great places to start with local information. Um, the Clark County Nature Network, we're here as well as a resource to help connect people to projects, whether you need mentoring with a high school to come in and do a project with either their CTE programs or their shop program to help build something or scouts. We have connections now with the local scout, uh, regional scout troop. We can help uh, make partnerships. I'm going to share with you, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, bear with me a second here, is the webinar series. I'll zoom out a little bit here. Um, so this is our series. Hopefully you all have this flyer. Um, uh, so we're right here at the Hazeldell. Next week will be me talking about the Green and Schoolyards if you're interested in starting. Then we have Pete Dubois who's been doing the Master Composting Program for a while. He's an expert. He can talk about composting either on your school grounds or even in your classroom. Well, we tried something at how to do it in the classroom and it worked really well. Um, and some of these other topics, especially recess, we have lots of ideas. This is a recess program at Hauk Elementary School. They have a horticultural therapist 
on staff uh, on with a grant funded uh, position um, that comes to the school for both recess and after school programs. So lots of, of ways to get kiddos engaged. Once again, on behalf of the Clark County Nature Network, we are so excited that you're here. Um, we know that in both Evergreen and Vancouver schools, there's lots of new schools coming online and they all have gardens. That's my fault. <laughs> I encourage it. Some of you have sensory gardens, some of you have butterfly gardens, some of you have raised beds that are open to everybody um, to dream big, uh, but we're starting small. Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what is one of your uh, success stories that you'd like to share with teachers who are either starting out or getting their feet wet in, in gardening? Um, I, I think that um, I was able to really connect with one teacher. Actually, we co-taught a nature studies class and she eventually started using the vegetable garden for her class. Um, they did a historical garden as part of their social studies unit. They planted a um, they planted a pioneer garden. I talked a little bit about it last week, and I think she got the idea from Little House on Prairie, and they researched, you know, what kinds of crops the um, pioneers might have planted for their home gardens, and also what they might have used for a cash crop. But I think the big success from that was that as she talked to other teachers about it, more and more teachers started approaching me um, to use the garden or have me come into their class and do some kind of a garden lesson. And it's just been very incremental, very little step by little step that more and more teachers have become um, active using the outdoor learning space. And the other thing, changing the name from the garden to the outdoor learning space made a huge difference. A huge difference. When we called it the garden, people thought it was my garden and they couldn't, you know, come out there without my permission or whatever. But once I started calling it the outdoor learning space and just um, inviting people to use it however they wanted, even if it was the staff to come out and sit during their lunch hour, then I all of a sudden started finding more and more people out there. That's awesome. Thank you. And Barbara, you mentioned that uh, you have volunteers every Tuesday. Um, are you open to all volunteers coming to help out? Oh, the more the merrier. Yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> awesome. And are you able to host volunteer um, work parties right now during the COVID? Uh, yes, we're staying socially distant. The garden is obviously large enough that mm -hmm. we assign everybody a separate bed and uh, different areas of the part garden. Um, yeah. So it, it, it is a wonderful release for people who are tired of being at home and who want to contribute to the community. Yeah. And one thing I, I'd like to just share there, now that there are so many gardens going in, whether it's sensory or butterfly uh, or sunflower patches or strawberry patches, that um, one thing to think about during COVID, and we'll kind of touch on this in the upcoming sessions is, you know, if there's a, a plant that you think kids might get excited about and you can tie one of your lessons in your remote learning lessons and like okay after hours go with your family and visit your campus and look for this whatever and then you can build a lesson around them to go you know in the evenings to visit um, and find that sunflower and then count how many petals how many how big are the leaves and you can wrap in art or math or you know write a poem about something you find on your campus or go at, at twilight with your family and just listen and then write down your observations about what you hear on your campus. Um, not every school has that much nature, but you can find nature anywhere. So I think even during these challenging times, we can encourage our families to visit, even if we're in remote learning mode, um, with the hope that we all get back out there, hands-on discovery very early. Thank you once again for all of you to join us today. There's more great sessions coming up and other guest speakers. And we really appreciate Barbara and Bobby and Jody for all the work that they've done in Hazeldale. Um, you really have laid the groundwork for so many other schools to be successful and we are, we applaud you and honor your spirit to do what you do, so thank you. Well, thank you for all that everybody does to help support school gardens and to, to foster the idea of getting kids outdoors. Leave no child inside. Exactly. I agree. Thank you.
All right. Thanks, everybody. It was nice to see you all. Nice to meet you all. And we wish you well. And we hope to see you all next week.